decisions. Making decisions. You know, some people just have a hard time. They don't know what to decide. Do I? Don't I? Which way do I go? Do I turn left or turn right? Some of you know that earlier at my adventures in this area, I became a referee, both for basketball and volleyball. Did you see the, the video where the football referee messed up the coin toss and gave it to the wrong team? I have been there. You, you sometimes make a mistake. Although, if I made the mistake, I'd say, pardon me, let's redo that. But volleyball, we had to have a coin ready to toss and uh, decide on the direction of the game. And instead of having just a plain old quarter or a 50 cent piece, I took a piece of walnut and uh, made a big old coin out of it and then I inserted the quarter on both sides. So uh, I was flipping this big brown thing and catching it and it always got those girls' attention. Uh, you know, isn't it sad? Some people want to toss a coin to decide something. Now, I can understand, you know, a family's going out to eat. Somebody wants to go to Cheddar's, and when somebody else wants to go to Road, Texas Roadhouse, and they say, well, it's, we, to decide, we'll flip a coin, and they'll go whichever wins. But what if a family had to decide, today we'll leave or tomorrow, will he flip a coin? <clears throat> or people will flip a coin whether they are going to obey God or not obey God. We could carry that on uh, a long way, but I hope we have a better anticipation of what we know, what we want, but it's also compared to what we're responsible for. Shouldn't be a tossing a coin. Heads, I'll follow God, and tails, I'll be a part of the world. And yet, that's virtually what some people do in their lives. They toss a coin, and it's taking uh, a risk uh, following that way. You know, that a side shoot you know how many stories there are in the Bible about coins? About the widow lady who gave the two coins. She gave all that she had. Think about when when Judas uh, was out of the picture because he was dead. They wanted to have someone step in and take his place. They cast lots there in Acts chapter 1. Remember when the responsibility to pay the temple tax there in Matthew chapter 17? Uh, Jesus told one of them, go and uh, to the lake, and the first fish that you catch, look in its mouth and you'll find a coin. Pay the tax for me and you. And you look a little bit further, and it, it shows why they wanted to pay that tax. So that they would not offend anyone. Which is worse? Wrong decisions? Or no decisions at all. We realize if we make wrong decisions, there's consequences. I've tried to impress upon the minds of young people. Which path are you going to take? Are you going to look at that path and see where it leads? Or are you going to go down that path without thinking where it will take you? It might take you somewhere you don't want the results. Addiction, death, divorce, all kinds of things. Probably more harm resulting from the lack of decision than from wrong decisions. Go with me. Now, first of all, I wanted to look at Joshua. 
Joshua 24, verse 14. Uh, there's, of, of the two, of the, the spies that went into the land of promise, how many of them succumbed to the fear of the giants? We can't take the land. But two said, we trust God. It's ours already, Joshua and Caleb. And because of their decision and the choices that they made in favor of following God, obeying God, living for God, all of that generation, their age and older, died in the wilderness from 21 years up. They all died in the wilderness. But Joshua and Caleb, they got to enter into that land of promise. Remember what Joshua said in 24, 14? Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him sincere, in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods that your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I think because of that choice, the being the right kind of father, leading his family, leading, leading his children, they were able to enter into the land of promise. And Joshua, at the right time, would take the leadership of all the Israelites after Moses is gone. Now let's go to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings 18. This is shortly after the big contest between the prophets of Baal and Elijah. Remember the test, the fire, and, and the, the, the altars that each would uh, burn, either God or Baal? And I can't help but chuckle when looking at those prophets of Baal pleading for their God to come. He wouldn't. There wasn't any sound. There wasn't any presence. There wasn't any power. There wasn't any miracles. And they asked him, is your God on vacation? Where is your God? Is he asleep? Will he not listen to you? And God proved Elijah right. But during that time, there was 450 uh, prophets of Baal, chapter 18, verse 22. And after the victory, remember, remember Elijah going and sitting under the juniper tree? And there he's discouraged. I alone am serving God, no one else. But you go to the end of the chapter and you see that there's 7,000 that have not fallen to worship Baal. Compared to the 450, they were outnumbered big time. But here's Elijah finally realizing, I'm not alone. But aren't we glad that he chose to serve God? But there in chapter 18, verse 21, Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long will you halt between the two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Is that indecision? Or is that a decision? You see, a decision not to obey is a decision you're not going to obey. Whether you serve God, according to Joshua, or you don't serve him, there's no alternative. 
You know, some things doesn't matter what you choose. Whether it's a Coke or Dr. Pepper to, to drink. You know, a place to eat. It doesn't matter. Uh, unless it's a place of evil. You don't want to go there. But in some circumstances, a decision cannot be given at the moment. It doesn't hurt to say, you know what, I need a little more information. I, I need to take a moment. I need to pray about this, this what I'm fixing to step into. I would pray that every individual choosing to obey God thinks about the commitment behind that choice and if they're willing to follow through with it the rest of their life. But in many instances, it's possible and advantageous to make up our minds one way or the other. <coughs> because indecision does damage. I was in the, a large metroplex. The newspaper showed three people waiting at a city bus. Two of them were bored and, and tired of waiting and didn't know what to do, while a third happily played his, his game boy. The ad said, do something with your nothing. What do you do when you finished all your tasks and all your responsibilities? And you say, what is that? <laughs> you know. But there's moments of time that, what do we do? We kill time. I, I really believe also that we spend too much time with that phone in our hand looking at it. Be careful. It can be addictive. But this, this advertisement of this company was trying to sell this little device so people would use it in those moments of downtime. But it called that time of uh, waiting that nothing time. You know, but if we're responsible people, even as Christians, especially, there's no time that's not valuable in doing something for God. Too many folks, because they have no structure or dedication, will waste time, kill time, do things that have no matter whatsoever. To praise God. What about those times? Can you, while you're waiting, maybe not at a light in a vehicle, but at a at a doctor's office? Could you memorize scripture? Can you uh, acquaint yourself with someone waiting with you? Uh, introduce yourself and say, uh, "Have you thought about God lately? What are we doing during those times?" Paul challenged the Christians at Ephesus. Walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. One Greek scholar suggests that this refers to time as a strategic opportunity because there are seasons. Don't you know we have four distinct seasons in, in America? It gives variety. It gives us those times of opportunity to, to raise crops or food. But it means making a wise and sacred use of every opportunity to do good. When you're productive... Whether it's in a garden or whether it's in a job, there's people you come across. You can share your crops with individuals. You can share your experiences and helping someone else learn uh, a, a job that they can uh, jump into. But there's no real 
downtime. We can always use that time to learn something, to share something, to give something. That's better choices. The story of, of a college student. During the summer, he decided he would sell Bibles for extra income. And when he started, he the very first person he went to was the college president's home. And he knocks on the door, and and the wife of the house uh, lets him in. He, she recognizes him, and he tells her, I'm out knocking doors, selling Bibles. Would you like one? And she said to him, you know, we have enough Bibles. We don't really want one. And as he was walking away, she noticed that he was limping, and, and she made the remark, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were disabled. Almost like, if I'd known you were disabled, I would have bought a Bible in the first place. But then he turned, and he, she knew she hurt his feelings. And she said, wait, wait, wait. I didn't mean anything except admiration. And then she asked the question, doesn't your disability color your life? You know what the young man said? Yes, it does. But thank God I can choose the color. We don't know what people go through. With their hardships, their difficulties. And, and some people have a harder time than others. Imagine in third world nations what they have to decide when they have nothing. But isn't it encouraging to think you know, when Paul and Silas were in prison in Philippi there in Acts chapter 16 verses 19 to 25 they'd been beaten They've been told, don't you speak in this man's name any longer. But what they do in that prison, they praise God, sing songs. You see, they chose the bright color of praise instead of dark colors of depression, bitterness, despair. They could have played the song, woe is me. I'm here in this prison. But because of the other prisoners and that jailer hearing their devotion, their love for God, and singing to God, it made a difference in all of their lives. When the doors were open, it says none of the prisoners had escaped. If I had been a prisoner there seeing Paul and Silas, I don't know if I'd stayed. If I'd had the opportunity to run and escape, I may have done that. But somehow they stayed. Remember the jailer? <clears throat> Noticing he was about to take his life. And Paul and Silas says, Oh, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. What a decision that they made. No matter what affliction, no matter what crisis comes your way, choose the color. Choose how you're going to respond to it. We can receive a lot of spiritual encouragement from the inspired scriptures. And we can refuse to paint our lives with dull gray of grumbling and complaining. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, let's begin at verse 6. Hebrews, Hebrews 3, 6. But Christ as his son, over his own house, whose house are we, if... We hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the of hope firm unto the end. Circle that little word, if. If I do this, if I do that, 
Choose. Do you have hope? It's because you chose to live for Jesus. Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, the day of temptation, in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. We talked about Joshua and Caleb. <clears throat> Caleb, at the age of 85 years old, he said, this is mine. He ran up the hill to take possession. He had to battle for it. It was a gift, but he had to earn it. But that's the spirit he had. I believe what is necessary is we understand. There's a, a couple driving one day. They were behind this truck. They came to a red light. And as they stopped, and they were behind this old jalopy of a truck, kind of like mine. But there was all kinds of uh, bumper stickers just all over the tailgate and the bumper. And some of them were so old and faded you couldn't read them. But two stood out. Two. <laughs> one of them was Jesus, is, Jesus Christ is the only way. Now, if that was the only bumper sticker there, it would tell and preach a sermon, wouldn't it? But there was another one that was very distinct and completely opposite the other one. It read beer, chicks, and pickups. Now, are you going to live for Jesus? Or are you going to live in the world? It's obvious. <laughs> Maybe that driver was keeping his options open. You know, back to that story of Elijah. There's the prophet. The question, how long will you fall between two opinions? All right, man, are you going to follow Jesus or are you going to be part of the world and just live uh, as the body desires? Fulfill every lust, every desire, or are you going to sacrifice and live pure unto Jesus Christ? There in 1 Kings 18, when, when Elijah is saying, well, are you going to decide? It wasn't as though Israel had abandoned the Lord altogether. They still call themselves his people, 2 Corinthians 11, 17. They exalted his law, his covenant, as, as the only guide to follow, Exodus 24, verses 1 through 8. <coughs> But Elijah observed something that the Israelites were kind of like that old man with the truck, keeping his options open. Apostle Paul pointed back to the Israelites of Moses' day by warning the Corinthian brethren there in 1 Corinthians 10, do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. Remember when Moses and Joshua, there on the mountain, had received the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments? They're the first time they came, and there was a noise. And they said, what's that noise? And the answer came back to them. The people had begun to play. And they thought, had fallen down to worship the golden calf. They made a choice. Where's Moses? He's been gone 40 days. He's not coming back. They made the wrong choice. And because of that, God says, you, you're going to be destroyed in the in the wilderness. To those Corinthians, he said in verse 21 of chapter 10, you cannot serve the cup of the Lord, the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Choices. 
as I close tonight, imagine being on a ball team and you're wearing the, the Texas Rangers uniform. You're representing that club and its rules. And all of a sudden you find your team behind. Are you going to put on the other team's jersey? Are you going to take your ball glove? Are you going to play defense against, against your own team? You can't straddle both sides of the spiritual fence. You can't change uniforms in the middle of the way. Jesus is the only way. There's no other bumper sticker. There's no other law. No one can serve two masters. Matthew 6, 6 24. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, the disciple cannot put his hands to the plow and look back. Spiritual blessings are ahead, but my associations with the world, what's going on? Who turns into a pillar of salt because she wanted to look, see what happened in Sodom. Her curiosity, maybe her longing to go back and live there. She was turned into a pillar of salt. Choices. I hope that we will always learn, always choose to do the right thing, to do the spiritual thing, to do that which builds someone else up, and do that which brings someone else to the life of Jesus Christ. What have you decided for your life? Come while we stand and while we sing.